Um, I'm Nicholas Maxwell. Um, I'm giving this talk. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Although you haven't heard what I'm going to say yet. Um, are universities doing enough to save us from impending disaster? Well, just to make absolutely clear, so in case you don't understand the rest of the lecture, my answer is going to be no, they're not doing enough. Um, we need to transform our universities so that they do more to help us with our problems. I'm sure that all of you will have noticed that where humanity faces a serious crisis, perhaps an unprecedented crisis. Um, and this is, uh, becomes apparent if you consider the very serious global problems that we're faced by. So I'm very briefly going to say a word or two about our global problems. Population growth. Around 1800, there were about one billion people on the planet. Now there are seven and a half billion. It's going to go up to 10 billion, possibly 11 billion by the end of this century. That's the first big problem. We have, there are too many people. Um, destruction of natural habitats, loss of wildlife, and mass extinction of species as I'm probably sure you also all know, um, we're going through what's sometimes called the sixth great extinction. There have been massive extinctions before in the history of life on this planet um, due to natural events. Um, this one is being caused by us. Some estimations put the rate of extin extinctions as something like 10 to 100 species a day go extinction, go extinct. We don't really know how many different species there are on this planet. We have sort of estimations. Um, but that's, a, that's the sort of uh, calculations that are made. The lethal character of modern war. Um, in the 19th century, around 12 million people died as a result of war. In the 20th century, it was over 100 million. And we're not doing very well in this century either. By the way, can you all hear me? I don't want to be speaking here. And can you, you all understand what I'm saying? I'm not talking too quickly or too slowly. Good. Um, the threat of nuclear weapons. The mere existence of these nuclear weapons ready to be fired at the touch of a button is a, a, a danger. On a number of occasions in the past, um, if everybody had done what they're supposed to do, we would have had nuclear devasta devastation. Flocks of geese, the moon has been misinterpreted or, or simply malfunctioning of, or, of computer systems has been interpreted as the other side is, has set off all its rockets, so we have to respond. Um, and sooner or later, by, because of accident or hacking or rising conflict, um, it will happen. And we really need to, it's a, a menace, and we really need to get rid of them. Um, vast inequalities of wealth and power around the globe. There has always been an inequality, except when we lived in small hunting and gathering tribes, perhaps. Um, Oxfam estimated last year that the 42 wealthiest people on Earth own as much as the, ha the poorest half of the population of the Earth. It's something sort of obscene when, it seems to me, when uh, inequality gets to that level. And then there is pollution of earth, sea, and air. Um, 
plastics in the oceans, the, uh, the oceans becoming more acidic, um, coral reefs, the tropical rainforests of the oceans dying, and then finally, the impending disasters of climate change, which is perhaps the most serious problem. Um, we've known about this for a very long time. We've certainly known about it since 1958, 1960, when very precise measurements were made of the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. We knew that that was going to cause global warming. That's uh, 60 years ago. Um, and even so, the rate in which CO2 is emitted increases, despite all the efforts, increases uh, uh, in the atmosphere due to us. Um, why have we encountered, why, why do we have this crisis now? What is it about our times uh, that, that, that has, has led to this? What, what's behind it all? Well, what I'm going to uh, argue is that there is actually uh, a very simple answer to that question. And, and it can be put like this, that humanity faces two great problems of learning. Learning about the nature of the universe and about ourselves and other living things as a part of the universe and learning how to become civilized or enlightened or wise. We've solved the first great problem of learning. We solved that when we created modern science, modern science and technology, essentially in the 17th century. We discovered a method, scientific method, for progressively improving our knowledge and technological know-how. But we haven't solved the second great problem of learning. And that combination of solving the first problem and not solving the second problem puts us into a situation of great danger. Because as a result of solving the first great problem, as a result of the immense intellectual success of modern science and technology, we enormously increase our power to act, or at least some of us increase their powers to act. And this can have all sorts of good consequences, as it has in all sorts of ways. It's made the modern world possible. But it has also been responsible for all our global problems. All our global problems as a re are the result of new things we've been able to do um, as a re that have been made possible by modern science and technology. Modern science and technology lead to modern industry, modern agriculture, modern hygiene, modern medicine, modern armaments, and so to all the global problems that I've been talking about. So it's that combination of solving the first problem, not solving the second, that is so dangerous. When we solve the first problem, it becomes a, a really urgent matter for us to learn how to become a little bit more civilized or enlightened or wise, the whole world. But how on earth are we going to do this? I mean, you know, religious leaders, prophets, philosophers have been holding forth about the need for more wisdom for centuries, millennia, um, and we don't seem to be much wiser these days. In fact, in some ways, if you've been reading the news recently, we seem to be get, been getting a bit more stupid um, how on earth are we going to solve this second great problem of learning? Well, I have a suggestion. What we need to do is learn from our solution to the first great problem of learning how to go about solving the second problem. This is actually a very standard principle of rationality, that you, if you have a big problem, you should look around for a somewhat analogous problem that you've already solved and see if you can adapt the solution to that problem to the new problem. So that's the idea, to learn from scientific progress how to make social progress toward a better world. 
um, I had this idea. Well, actually, really, it's the idea of a, a philosopher who used to uh, be at the London School of Economics, and I used to go to his seminars, and he had this idea, um, although he would never have put it like that. He put forward a view of what it is that makes scientific progress possible, and then he generalized it to an idea of rationality that he called critical rationalism, and then applied it to social and political problems. And then I realized that Popper hadn't, Karl Popper hadn't got it quite right, and it needed to be improved. And then I realized that actually this is rather an old idea. It goes back to the 18th century, to the Enlightenment, especially to the French Enlightenment. Have you, uh, do you know what the Enlightenment was? Uh, does everybody know? Is there anyone here who doesn't know what the Enlightenment was? I mean, it was a Euro very much a European affair. Um, first of all, there was um, the scientific revolution that led to the creation of modern science, uh, Galileo, Kepler, Newton, and many others. And then in the 18th century, that was in the 17th, 16th, 17th century, and then in the 18th century, there was this sort of burst of enthusiasm for, for science, or natural philosophy, as they would have called it, re reason and experience, and uh, t trying to solve problems by appealing to reason and experience rather than just to authority and tradition, especially the, the French Enlightenment. Um, to, to learn, and I think this was the, the nub of what the French Enlightenment was about, to learn from scientific progress how to make social progress towards an enlightened world. Um, the, I've said all this, here we are. And the really important thing to appreciate is that if you're going to carry out this enlightenment idea, um, there are three steps to it. First of all, you have to get clear about what it is that makes it possible for science to make progress. If we assume that this is essentially scientific method, we need to get clear about what scientific method is that makes it possible when put into practice to progressively improve our scientific knowledge and understanding of the universe. Then we need to generalize this. So we arrive at a general idea of what one might call rationality, um, which uh, helps us to solve problems or achieve goals of, of all kinds not just to the goal of improving knowledge. So we generalize the whole idea of scientific method to arrive at an idea of rationality and then apply it to the social world, try to get into the social world, into our other institutions, into government and industry and agriculture and education and all our other endeavors uh, and our ways of living so that we learn how to make progress uh, towards a better world. That's the key idea. But, unfortunately, the philosophers of the Enlightenment, the French Enlightenment, got all three steps wrong. They botched the job. They, they blundered. And it was that botched version of the Enlightenment which then got developed throughout the 19th century, and then built into academia in the 20th century. So universities today do actually, in a way, exemplify this idea of learning from the first problem how to solve the second problem. It's just that they're a malformed version of that idea. The, the, the mistakes have not been corrected. So what I'm going to do is to say something about the actual Enlightenment program, the one that actually happened and that we now are the victims of. Um, and then, I, then I'll give you uh, a first version of a more correct version of the Enlightenment. And then if I have time, uh, a second version or a third version which uh, makes further corrections. Um, So, the, the 
Philosophes, Voltaire, Condorcet, Diderot, um, and others, um, they, they, took for, they, they accepted, for them, the great hero was Isaac Newton, um, who discovered Newtonian theory. Um, and they took his uh, professed ideas as to how science ought to proceed. He was a sort of hero for the Enlightenment. And they, they accepted as the first step that science proceeds by basing uh, laws and theories uh, on evidence, by doing observation and experiments, and then arriving at laws and theories by induction. And they, they thought the proper way to generalize that was to generalize this conception of scientific method so that it can be applied to improving knowledge of social phenomena. If it's important for the betterment of humanity, to improve our knowledge of natural phenomena, which is something that Francis Bacon much earlier had stressed, surely it must also be important to improve our knowledge of our ourselves, of, of, of the social world. And so they set about creating the social sciences, um, anthropology, economics, psychology, uh, political science, uh, and the other social sciences. And then these got developed throughout the 19th century by a whole range of people like uh, John Stuart Mill, Karl Marx, uh, Durkheim, um, Max Weber, and the others. And then it was built into uh, universities with the creation of departments and disciplines of social science. And the outcome is universities primarily devoted to improving knowledge and technological, te technological know-how. Uh, natural science is devoted to improving our knowledge of the natural world. The social science is devoted to improving our knowledge of the social world. Um, and a few little oddments that don't quite fit in with that general scheme. So that's sort of the outcome uh, of, um, uh, of this of the actual enlightenment. And uh, we, we could call this conception of inquiry that emerges, uh, put very succinctly, that in order to help promote human welfare, academic inquiry must in the first instance acquire reliable knowledge and technological know-how. Universities must devote themselves to solving problems of knowledge once knowledge is acquired, it can be applied to help social problems. And that carries with it the implication that values, political ideas and programs, policies, philosophies of life, ways of living, must all be excluded from the intellectual domain of inquiry to make sure that only thing, factual ideas get into the intellectual domain relevant to uh, improving our knowledge of phenomena. And this is, the, this is what, essentially what we've inherited uh, from the 18th century. Um, and it, what I've just described probably fits universities as they were in the 1950s rather than today. Things, various things have happened. Not everything that goes on today quite accords with this idea of what, of what I'm calling knowledge inquiry. But this is, the, this is the kind of basic paradigm, the basic idea uh, as to what universities are doing. First of all, acquiring knowledge, then applying it to help solve social problems. Well, um, as I've said, uh, um, this uh, version of the Enlightenment makes three serious blunders. Um, and in a kind of way, this is encouraging, because uh, if w what we need to do is get clear about what the mistakes of the actual enlightenment were or are, and then put them right. It isn't as if we have to create an idea for, a, for a, a, an ideal university to help us learn how to become more civilized out of a vacuum or because I declare that this is what we need. What we, we have with a, a clear prescription, we, we can look at what the enlightenment actually did see where they went wrong, and then correct their mistakes. So that's what I'm now going to try to do. Um, 
And the, the, this is just to remind you of the three versions of the Enlightenment I'm talking about. The actual one that I just described briefly, the pr uh, a problem-solving version of the Enlightenment progress, correcting some of the flaws of the actual Enlightenment, and then uh, what I'm calling an aim-pursuing version, which corrects further flaws. And just to remind you, this is what we're talking about by the Enlightenment program. Well, uh, we could begin with Karl Popper's slightly improved ideas about scientific method. Um, what, what Popper stressed was that we can't verify theories, but we can falsify them. Um, and it's really through falsifying theories that, we that science makes progress, because we can discover that we're wrong, and we can then try to uh, develop an improved idea. So science proceeds by a process of conjecture and refutation. Um, and that idea about scientific method can be generalized to a general idea about rationality, which Popper called critical rationalism. Namely, if you have a problem, whatever kind of problem, problem in your life, you can, uh, the, the rational way to proceed is to explore possible solutions and then critically assess them in an attempt to try to find the, the best of those that are available. Um, so this version, the Popper version, will be to uh, then apply that to the social world. Um, and that's what Popper did in a famous book called The Open Society and Its Enemies, which is uh, essentially about uh, problems of civilization, um, the problems of developing what Popper called uh, the open society. Uh, uh, and and um, this notion of rationality, of critical rationalism, playing a crucial role. Um, but there is a sort of limitation to, to uh, Popper's idea about rationality, because very often a problem is so difficult uh, that we can't just solve it all at once. Um, and particularly if you think of in science, uh, a, a really big problem is what kind of universe is this? Well, we don't really know the answer to that. Um, we've been struggling to gradually develop an answer. Uh, the pre-Socratics in ancient Greece thought that they could solve that problem at a go, and they put forward various ideas, like everything is made of water, or everything is earth, fire, air, and water. Um, everything is fire. Nothing changes. Um, and um, they didn't really solve the problem, and you can't really solve the problem just like that at one go. You have to work gradually towards a solution. You have to try work at more uh, specialized, more specific problems, um, the orbits of the planets, uh, how b objects fall, for example, the problems that Galileo and Kepler tackled, uh, in to gradually work towards a solution to the fundamental problem. And the same thing holds clearly for the task of making social progress towards a more civilized, enlightened world. It's not something we're going to solve overnight. Um, it's going to take a long time. It's a big, difficult, profound problem with a multitude of aspects. Um, and uh, it's only something we're going to work gradually towards solving. So whenever you have a really big, difficult problem like that, the thing to do is to specialize, to tackle uh, preliminary problems, uh, specialized bits of the problem in an attempt to work gradually towards the, the problem you really want to solve. But if you do that, if you specialize, it's also really important to interconnect ideas about the fundamental problem you're trying to solve and the, all the specialized problems you're, you're, you're solving. Or you may get so lost in your specialized problem solving that you forget about what it is you're in the end trying to do. So that's... Um, these four uh, rules of rational problem solving um, that I extract from, from science, scientific method. And then the step three 
uh, would involve helping humanity resolve conflicts and problems of living in increasingly cooperatively rational ways so, so that what is of value in life may be achieved in a just way and so that social progress is made towards a good, civilized, wise, enlightened world. Now, you can see that what is involved here at step three is a radically different idea about what social inquiry ought to be. The actual enlightenment held the view that social inquiry is a science. First of all, it acquires knowledge, and then it applies it, perhaps. Here, the idea is entirely different. The idea is to actively, for academia, for universities, to take as an absolute priority to engage with the public, with the world outside the university, and try to help people to resolve conflicts and problems of living, including global problems or the local aspects of global problems, in more cooperatively rational ways. And to get into our institutions and our society and the way we live, uh, habits, uh, traditions of tackling problems in, in accordance with these rules of rational problem solving. Um, social inquiry will be much more like social methodology, social rationality, or the, the, the attempt to develop a more social, rational social world in this sense than social science. Um, there are some comments I should make about this third step because you may have uh, doubts about it. Um, the blunder is, uh, of the actual enlightenment is to develop the social science, uh, sciences alongside the natural sciences. And what I've been arguing is no, that we need to think of the social sciences as fundamentally different. Uh, actually, a, a, a sort of key example to think about is economics. Economics has always been pursued, developed, as if it were a social science, from back to Adam Smith, in the, in, who was a part of the Enlightenment. Um, if you look at all the introductory textbooks, um, well, I've looked at a number of them, and they all say economics is the science of economic phenomena, or it's about improving our knowledge about economic phenomena. But economics has, at its heart, a problem of living. Presumably, uh, it's sort of about the creation and distribution of wealth, or better, perhaps, the sustainable creation and just distribution of wealth. This is a problem of living. And it's very strange that economics has not been developed in the way that I'm suggesting here as attempts to improve our solution to that big problem of living, which would involve putting forward ideas as to how we might modify our economic activities, how we might develop new institutions, new ways of going about things, um, rather than developing theories about economic phenomena. Um, so that's, that's an example of the difference that I'm talking about. Um, Well, the first point, um, we tend to think of science, natural science, as being of value um, but culturally or intellectually because it improves our knowledge and understanding of aspects of the world around us and also of practical value in that it, it, it leads to technology and it helps us with solving practical problems in various ways. Well, this Enlightenment project is exploiting a third value of science rather underplayed, namely what one might call the methodological value of science. Science has, natural science has without question made astonishing progress. We ought to take seriously that there may be something very important to be learned about making progress in other areas of life than this one case where we really have made unquestionably 
very great uh, progress in our knowledge and understanding. Um, the, there are obvious reasons why it's going to be very much more difficult to make, even if we do what I'm suggesting, why it's going to be very much more difficult to make social progress towards a better, more civilized world than it is to make scientific progress uh, in our knowledge and understanding of the nature of the universe. In the case of science, scientific progress depends on there being a community of scientists who are highly motivated, well-paid, um, uh, devoted to their, their, their job, to, to, to their subject, um, and that's, that's all that's required. In the case of uh, uh, making social progress to a more civilized world, we're all involved, um, the highly motivated, the desperately unmotivated, the poor, um, the wealthy who want to hold on to their wealth, um, the mad, the ill, the old, the very young, um, all of us, uh, uh, and um, we're not well paid to, uh, no one, few people are well paid to, to help uh, the world learn how to become more civilized. Um, there is also the big difference that in science, there is this very decisive way of uh, discovering uh, when we've got things wrong. We can derive consequences from a theory uh, about uh, experiments that we could perform, predictions. We then do the experiment, and if the experiment uh, says something different happens, then we really have to recognize that the theory is false. We have this very decisive way of discovering that we've got things wrong in science. But we don't really have that in life. Um, a new policy is implemented. Usually what happens is that some people suffer from it, other people benefit from it. There's a mixture of responses, and it's unclear uh, whether it's good or bad. And also, if you start implementing a policy, it acquires a certain life of its own. People get involved. Um, some people benefit from it and are very reluctant to, 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 to say, um, uh, the whole thing is a disaster, let's, let's stop. Uh, and politicians are rather, uh, it's rather unusual for politicians to say, no, that was a very bad idea that I had. Um, it's been a disaster. I'm so sorry. Uh, we should stop. This very rarely happens in politics. It does happen in science all the time. And the other difference is that um, we can perform experiments in science um, unless, of course, their experiments involving people um, without uh, disastrous consequences. But performing ex social experiments, if they go horribly wrong, can lead to suffering uh, uh, and misery. Um, all the more reason why should we should try and perform experiments in our uh, social experiments in our imagination. Because if you only suffer in your imagination, that's not as serious as suffering in real life. So we need to develop the, 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 the traditions of, of imagining possible actions and, and looking very critically at, at uh, how they could go disastrously wrong. So, there, so there, even if we have universities rationally devoted to helping humanity learn how to make social progress towards a better world. We're not going to make the rapid progress towards a better world that we can see science making in improving our knowledge. But I don't think that's a reason for not doing it. On, on the contrary, it's a reason for, for, because it is so difficult and so vital for our future. Um, that we should uh, take the task very seriously. Um, I, I think I've said something about uh, rationality. Uh, so one, may, one might think that the idea of a rational society is, is a sort of horrific society, um, where everyone has to be ruled by reason so that you know, you're not allowed any kind of free will at all. You've got to do what is rational all the time. 
um, act in accordance with algorithms, in effect. Um, well, the conception of reason that I've been employing here is not like that. It doesn't prescribe precisely what you should do. It tells you what to attempt to do, but it doesn't specify precisely how you have to act. And in fact, in, in tackling our problem rationally, in accordance with these strategies, we give ourselves our best opportunity to achieve what we really want to achieve and what is really desirable and of value to achieve. Um, so far from restricting our freedom, it would enhance our freedom. And the last point I wanted to make was, oh, well, uh, um, but perhaps the whole idea is a mistake and we should, first of all, really, we have to, if we're going to be rational, first of all, acquire knowledge and then apply it. Well, um, there are all sorts of things wrong with that. Um, first of all, if we don't have some preliminary idea about what our problem is, we don't know what kind of knowledge it's relevant to try to develop. Um, a very slight change in the way one construes one's problem may lead to a dramatic change in the kind of knowledge it's relevant to try to develop. If you think of medicine, for example, and you think of medicine as having to do with curing disease, then there's a whole lot of knowledge and technology that we should try, that is relevant to try to develop. But suppose we just slightly change the way we think of the basic problem of medicine to include uh, the prevention of disease, then a whole lot of other knowledge becomes relevant. Instead of um, drugs to cure disease, it's all about uh, taking exercises and um, not uh, smoking and other things like that. So just a slight change in the way you formulate a problem can dramatically change what kind of knowledge it's relevant to develop. And of course, the other point to make is that many problems, many problems of living, uh, including the global problems I started off with, um, for their solution, they, what they require is that we start acting in new ways, not um, uh, that we don't need new knowledge, we need to do new things. Um, for example, the problem of uh, nuclear weapons doesn't really need new technology to solve. It, it needs us to start uh, doing new things, getting rid of nuclear weapons. Um, and uh, so, so it, it, there is a sense in which what r the really important thing is to have the capacity to act in the world, to imagine possibilities, and to have the capacity to acquire knowledge when relevant. But it is not the case that you first of all acquire knowledge and then apply it. Um, that's... Uh, a very bad idea about how to rational procedure. So this is my um, sort of attempt at indicating diagrammatically what a university would look like if it took seriously uh, this second enlightenment program I've been talking about. At the heart of the enterprise, we would have this activity of articulating problems of living, problems that we encounter in our lives, and proposing and criticizing possible solutions, which are actions, things that we do, policies, political programs, uh, philosophies of life, ways of living, new institutional arrangements. Um, that's fundamentally what universities ought to be doing, absolutely centrally and fundamentally. And furthermore, an absolutely basic task of universities Need to be, needs to be public education about what our problems are, what our problems of living are, and what we need to do about them. And public education, um, which, so the arguments and discussion and ideas go in both directions, so that people out there in the world may have important things to teach academics locked away in uh, lecture rooms, like me, for example, here, just as much as the other way around. It's not a question, of course, of universities instructing the rest of humanity how they ought to live. Um, what really matters is the thinking that goes on in social life. And universities are there to help us to develop that thinking in ways that are, uh, we're all ultimately going to uh, benefit from. Um, one, one ought to think of universities as a sort of... Uh, 
people's civil service doing uh, what actual civil services are supposed to be doing in secret for governments, doing openly for the public as a kind of resource to help us to solve our problems. Um, and, uh, of course, also um, rule three needs to be implemented, namely specialized, so that around there you have more specialized problem solving, but that needs to interact with um, more thinking about our fundamental problems of living. So, th so that it means that ha ha what changes will be be need to be made to uh, universities as they exist today to become what I'm arguing is what we really need. The most dramatic difference is the nature of uh, social inquiry. Social, the social sciences ought to be rethought not as sciences, but as the activity of helping us to tackle our problems of living in more cooperatively rational ways than we do at present. Um, furthermore, social inquiry rethought in this way is intellectually more fundamental than the natural sciences, which is very different again from the situation today where we would say the natural science is intellectually more fundamental than the social sciences. Um, and the whole relationship between the university and society at large needs to change because universities are not, as it were, just studying the social world, but rather engaging with it, actively uh, uh, participating with trying to uh, develop more rational ways of, of, of resolving our problems. Right, well, that, that's the first version. And just a remark about knowledge inquiry, which is what we broadly what we have today, um, the outcome of the actual Enlightenment, embodying the blunders of the uh, philosophers of the Enlightenment, um, that insofar as academic inquiry gives priority to tackling problems of knowledge, and then only secondarily applying knowledge to help solve social problems, um, well, of the three rules of rational problem sol solving, four rules rather, of rational problem solving that I mentioned, the third one, the one about specialized, is exemplified magnificently. This is uh, surely uh, an abundantly clear feature of modern uh, universities, modern academia, that there is massive specialization. Um, but the other three rules are all violated because universities do not put at the heart of the enterprise the activities, the intellectual activities of articulating problems of living and proposing and criticizing possible solutions, possible actions, policies, and so on. That goes on, but very much at the fringe, not at the heart of the enterprise. And since that doesn't go on fundamentally, then there can't be the business of interacting, thinking about our fundamental problems, our problems of living, and more specialized problems of knowledge and technological know-how. So universities as they are today structurally violate three of the four most elementary rules of rational problem solving one can think of. It's as bad as that. That's what this argument comes up with. It's not just me saying it. Um, Well, I, I think I should probably be stopping now, should I, to give you a chance to... Uh, can I just quickly indicate what the second version is, uh, of the uh, Enlightenment is? Um, so far, I've assumed that, without really talking about it very much, that um, science, natural science, the basic aim is truth, and the basic method is to assess claims to knowledge uh, with respect to evidence. And that's what the philosophers of the 18th century believed in, more or less, and that's what scientists today believe in as well. Well, it's wrong. Um, if you look at physics, you find that physics only ever accepts unified theories. That is, a theory in order to be acceptable, Newtonian theory, quantum theory, general relativity, um, in order to be acceptable, 
it must say that the same laws apply to all the phenomena that the theory applies to. You can't have a kind of patchwork quilt theory that says one set of laws over here, another set of laws over here, another set of laws over here. Um, but there are always going to be endlessly many such patchwork quilt theories that you concoct, which can be concocted to fit the phenomena even better than the theories that we actually accept. But those never get considered for a moment. So in physics, we are always only accepting theor unified theories, even though there are endlessly many disunified rival theories that fit the facts even better. They never get even considered. What that means, in my view, is that the whole enterprise of physics is making a big assumption, a big implicit assumption about the world. Namely, the world is such that none of these patchwork quilt theories is true. There really is some kind of underlying unity in nature. Well, how do we know? This is sort of a conjecture, an article of faith not something we've really established. Um, precisely for that reason, we need to, um, and th this is the sort of uh, argument that there are these two constraints on theories, empirical success, of course, and also this other constraint that it must be unified. And that means that there is this big assumption lurking in the whole enterprise. Or put another way, the basic aim of physics is deeply problematic because the aim is to discover in what precise way the universe is unified, what kind of unified theory of everything there is. Um, but we have no idea that the universe is, is like that. So we need to put forward conjectures and subject them to critical assessment, or more specifically, I argue, that we need to represent this assumption in the form of a hierarchy of assumptions. And as you go up the hierarchy, the assumptions get less and less substantial, till at the top we have an assumption like the universe is such that we can acquire some knowledge of our local circumstances sufficient to make life possible. Well, if that's false, we've had it whatever we assume. So we're never wanting to, uh, to go, we're never wanting to reject that assumption. And as, then as we go down the hierarchy, the assumptions get more and more substantial and more and more likely to be wrong. And then we try to choose those lower assumptions that are the most, that seem to, to give the most uh, help with improving our knowledge. So that we, uh, and then that leads to an ad adaptation of methods as well. So we improve our aim and our methods or our assumption and methods as we proceed, it's a kind of feedback between improving our knowledge and understanding of what kind of universe this is and uh, the methods we employ in improving knowledge. Um, and um, the, the next diagram looks a bit complicated, but it sort of exemplifies that idea of this hierarchy. And progressively improving the assumptions as we proceed. Something like this has actually gone on in science, or we would be stuck with Aristotelian science. Um, we, we actually have improved metaphysical assumptions built into the scientific enterprise, but it's gone on in a kind of surreptitious fashion. Well, it's this idea that we need to generalize and get into social life, because it isn't just in science that aims are problematic, in life, too, aims are problematic, both for us individually and institutionally. In fact, if you think about it, all our global problems are due to the fact that we've pursued aims like progress, for example, thinking that they were wonderful and not appreciating the downsides, the bad aspects uh, of, of the aims, such as industrial agricultural progress, progress in human welfare, also, unfortunately, leads to serious bad consequences for the natural world, for other species, um, and ultimately for us, because of global warming. Um, so we, we need to build into our other institutions, besides science, this idea that aims often are problematic. The aims we're actually pursuing 
are problematic in all sorts of ways that we may not recognize. And so we need to try and improve our aims and our methods as we live, as we proceed. And, um, and just one more example. And th so this is the, the diagram applied to the endeavor of trying to uh, make progress towards a, civili a genuinely civilized world. Um, at the top, we have the assumption, the aim uh, to achieve that ideal realizable social order, whatever it may be we ought to try to attain in the long term. Well, who can quarrel with that? I mean, it's so open-ended and vague that, it, that no one's going to question that. And then as you come down the hierarchy, the aims get more specific and much more problematic and controversial and may need revision as, as we improve our ideas. So this is the sort of uh, framework we should have um, in, a, in our efforts to try to make progress towards uh, a good, wise, civilized, enlightened world. I use these terms more or less um, synonymously. Right, so this is my conclusion um, that universities are not doing everything that they might be doing. We need, we need a kind of quite dramatic change in, the, uh, in, our, uh, in universities so that they get, make as an absolute priority the really fundamental problem we now face of making progress towards a more civilized world, or I think we will end up destroying ourselves sooner or later. Um, and then here are some of the things that I have uh, written about this over the years. I've been going on about this for a very long time. I published a book called From Knowledge to Wisdom, in 1984, which was highly praised in Nature and various other places, and then forgotten about. And I've, every year or two, I publish another book. I give talks. Um, but, but universities, all about innovation, in some ways, are very conservative and resistant to change. And there have been a little changes. There's a thing here. Have you heard of something called the Grand Challenges Program? No. Well, there is a thing called the Grand, Chal <laughs> Grand Challenges <laughs> Program. Um, and there's been a bit of an, Im uh, of an input from my ideas into that. But it doesn't go nearly far enough. Um, I have a handout. Um, and it's a, a list of the changes that need to be made to universities as they are now if we're going to have what we really need. So, and on the table there, I put some leaflets about some of my books. Um, one of them, Karl Popper's Science and Enlightenment, which was published uh, in 2017, is published by UCL Press, and you can download it for free, so if you're interested. And there's a, there's a preface which sort of summarizes really this, this talk. So if you're interested, you can have a look at that. Thank you. So change in a sustainable way. Well, I, I think you should always um, ask questions of your lecturers uh, why they're, they're doing what they're doing and, and how it how what we're doing, how what he is doing or she is doing relates to some of the really urgent issues that, that are, are going on. Um, that's, that's one kind of change. I, th I think um, students are, uh, you're, you're in a sort of funny position because uh, you're, in one way you're at the bottom of the, the, the whole <laughs> hierarchy. But in another way, you're, you're the customer these days. You know, you have a certain, uh, you should have a certain influence. So I, I think you do have a, a really important role. I, I think students ought to be um, seizing on this and getting a, a, a student movement going to change universities. Because actually, I think what I, what I have been arguing really is the case. Our, the really urgent problem of learning we now have is to learn how to have a better world. And this really is uh, uh, because, because of the, the, the crisis situation we're in. Um, when before, before modern science and technology, 
wisdom is a kind of private luxury. Now it's a kind of public necessity. Um, and by wisdom, I mean simply the capacity, the active endeavor, and the desire to realize what is of value in life for oneself and others. Um, so it includes knowledge, technological know-how, and understanding, but a whole lot of other, other things as well. And that and wisdom should be the basic aim of, of universities, not knowledge. I mean, knowledge is there, it's important, it's, it's an integral part of wisdom. Yes, sorry. Say that again. Uh, why do we always ask some question about, um, about why we're doing what we're doing? Um, well, yes, I think, I, I, I think one of the... I taught for 30 years uh, in this institution, and um, one of the things I discovered was that uh, you, you get a lot of answers to questions, but you're often not told what the questions were in the first place, um, you're very rarely given an opportunity to articulate your own questions. Uh, and, and also, the whole educational process um, tends to be one of trying to get rid of this feeling of stupidity. Uh, after all, that's, isn't that the idea, to stop being stupid and become intelligent and educated? But actually, where you feel stupid, where you feel baffled, that's where your real intelligence and, creative and, and intellectual creativity lies. And it's often really difficult to turn a feeling of bafflement into an articulated question. And there's very little encouragement in a lot of university education to, 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 to encourage students to, to, to do that, let alone to go on and explore um, questions that, that you raise. I mean, I would like to have at least one university where you go to the university with a question, with a problem, uh, and, and you're assessed in terms of, is this a good question to be exploring? To, in other words, a, a, a university of research rather than of instruction. And you learn by trying to do, trying to... And I think a course should be an exploration of a problem. And then you may have to, along the way, learn things, of course, to deepen your understanding about the problem that you're exploring. And, and some courses perhaps are taught like that, but or, or a lot aren't. And, and I think that edu you know, the, the, it, it all, this involves also a transformation of education as well as research. But um, there's a very um, sh uh, short book that I published a year or two ago, which I brought along, called, here it is, it's quite short, it's called How Universities Can Help Create a Wiser World, and that's what it does. Um, and so you can have a look at this, it's, all, it's in the library. So, so any, any lingering doubts about what it was that I was on about during this year um, can be dispelled with a, a glance at that or, at, for example, arguing for wisdom in universities, which is a kind of autobiographical account of my attempts to get universities to pay attention to wisdom. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.